Hello, everyone. Welcome for, thank you for joining us. I'm Donna Davies and I'm a filmmaker based in Halifax, mostly do documentaries, um, but I'm super, super big fan of uh, genre films. And I'm really excited to have the opportunity today to have an in-depth conversation with the amazing genre filmmaker, Karen Lam. And she's based in Vancouver. And um, we almost uh, crossed paths and missed each other because of a time zone thing, but here we are. <laughs> Welcome, Karen. Thank you, and I'm so sorry. I think uh, technology left over. I have a new cell phone and um, I'm not good at that. Like I, I had updated things, but I think it, it hadn't, anyway, it's all you know fine what? now. I love it. I love these Zoom things where we're all in different parts of the world and it, there's always that little bit of extra challenge, which makes it actually kind of fun. <laughs> what do we call it? It's more exciting. It's, it's definitely more exciting. <laughs> exactly, it's, it definitely adds a little adrenaline to the mix. Um, I just want to start, uh, I think this conversation is mostly uh, going to be about uh, your career and maybe for people out there that have an interest in getting involved in uh, genre filmmaking and they want to understand what the ride is like, you can give them a little bit of insight into what it's, what it's been like. Um, I've, I've loved this little quote about you um, and I'm going to sort of start out with that because it can lead, lead us right into, uh, into your career. Uh, check it out living, breathing contradiction. <laughs> Trailblazer, but let's go with the living, breathing contradiction. Let's, let's start out um, with your uh, foray from your previous career into, the, into your decision to become a, a filmmaker. So many forays. Um, I was basically like, I, I think that so many people ask whether it's a straight line, but did you always know? Of course I didn't know. I had no clue. Right. Like I, um, you know, I grew up in Brandon, Manitoba. Um, I had images of being a concert pianist. That was it. I started piano when I was three years old. Um, I think I, I was actually going through old photos and there's me at three singing. God, like I'm so glad there's no like there's no sound on those photos um and then uh I I was always into like fine art I was like I painted I did portraits for many years and then I thought I discovered sewing so I, I was actually in fashion design so it's literally like so many different creative paths that I was thinking of and ultimately um after my first degree I ended up in fashion design for a year in Toronto and then um, that failed miserably because life on the catwalk was not, like, I'm not a cat, I'm not that person, but I also didn't want to be Tim Gunn. Like, I realized that was not the, the place for me. And I panicked, wrote my uh, LSAT and got into law school. So was not, that was also not the career of choice. I ended up in insurance law for um, insurance defense. That's, uh, that was me. Like, if you've been injured, I'm going to deny your claim. That's me. <laughs> And um, I, I ended up uh, basically, luckily, uh, producing for, like, after my law, I mean, I was still a lawyer, but I got hired in uh, to work in finance. So I always thought I was going to be, um, I was thinking Sher Sherry Lansing, you know what I mean? Like, head of some, like, I always wanted this, like, you know, Lady Gladriel power thing, which I was going to end up, um, you know, head of some big studio in Hollywood. That's what I was thinking. I'm a lawyer. I'm going to do financing. I'm going to you know, I'm not going to be on set. Lo and behold, <laughs> how many years later, you end up on set and then that's all you do. And so it's, a, it's been an interesting and circuitous path, but it's not something that I planned. I think that if for every choice that I made, it was because I had hit some sort of roadblock. Um, you know, you hit, uh, it, it was always a crosswalk, a, a crossroads that I would get Ooh. to. Yeah. Crosswalk yeah. too. I, what are you gonna do, right? And, uh, yeah, so I, I think for anyone, kudos if you came out of the womb knowing you were going to be a filmmaker, but that was not, that was not where I, I really thought. And even still, I was kicking and screaming. Um, I think my first short film, uh, it was for the National Screen Institute Drama Prize. Um, even on that set and after I finished it, um, I remember an interviewer asking me at, at our Q&A, you know, has the writing directing bug bit you? And I said, oh God, no, I'm a good producer. Why would I give that up? Like there, <laughs> there's no way this is, this is not the path for me. And it was, and I actually said the path is hell. Why would I want to be doing that? 
And it was interesting because Norm Bolin, who at that point was vice president of Alliance Atlantis, he was staying at the same hotel. We were all at the uh, Fort Gary in Winnipeg for the film exchange. And uh, he caught me coming out of the elevator and he said, to answer your question, you should be on the path. And, you know, I've seen your short film, you should be doing this. And it is hell, but you should be on it. And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and it still took me another, um, I think it wasn't until my second feature that I actually thought, okay, maybe I should do this. But the whole time I was in denial. I really was thinking, you know what? This will just make me a better producer. I'm, uh, I, you know, I should learn how to write and direct. That's about it. I, I, I didn't think that this was going to be it. Wow. Do you think that there's some, I, I hadn't even imagined this as a question, but just as you speak about that kind of a foray being, you know, wasn't really what you anticipated. Do you think that there are some things um, that, uh, having that kind of a brain that could do that detail work that you did in law really prepared you to be able to be like in charge of so many departments and everything on a film shoot. Like were there things that parlayed into the next career? Well, it definitely parlayed into producing because I was always negotiating contracts. I was always, and uh, I was in litigation, not a solicitor, which meant that I was in court. So you're always presenting a story, right? Like you're, you are there on behalf of your client and your big thing of restating the facts is basically you telling the story from your perspective or your client's perspective. So I think in a lot of ways, script structure isn't that different. You're learning a different type of structure, but you're still doing a fact pattern of sorts. You're still spinning an interesting tale that people are. And hopefully by the end, you're still coming up with some sort of, um, again, I don't necessarily go in with a theme or a moral or, you know, however it is with the script, but you're still wanting to land that thing. And so I, I feel like um, that's what I used to do in law too, which is you have to land your case, you have to land your, your position. And so I think that's the same sort of thing. And so thinking quickly on your feet, you know, that's what I was doing in, in court. I think that that's still a part of it. And I think that um, I'm fortunate going through law that I had so much management training and no one told me that film directing they think it's so creative you know like you you think in your head when you're going into it that it's going to be you coming up with colors you doing these things but so much of it once you're actually on set is managerial it's basically making sure that all of your departments are you know going in the same direction that everyone's feeling heard that you know what i mean that you're you're literally hopefully managing it and keeping all the plates spinning but because you've had you're an artistic person, obviously you sang and you, you did, you know, you did everything. So um, for you, because you obviously have a sharp mind and you have the artistic side, what do you think when you think back on the whole thing now was like the biggest challenge to taking on that role, not producer, because it seems like that's well suited to a career in law. But once you jumped off the plate there and straight into it's I'm a director then what what were the things that you found the most the most challenging about that new role actors yeah. actors were the hardest thing because they're so emotional and i did i always spent like I, i'd say for the first three productions so a short film my first feature and even into my second feature uh second short film that i did after I really avoided the actors if I could, you know, like I was with my DP, I was with the, the, the technical department. It was everybody, but because they always came up with questions about the script, they were all from an emotional perspective. And I don't know whether or not that's why I gravitated to our genre, but I'm not all that touchy feely. So this idea that they're like, you know, how am I feeling? I'm like, I don't know, what did I write? How, how do you feel? You know, it was always, um, getting into that sort of space it wasn't actually until my I think that was second my second short film third short film it was um it's called The Stolen and I had a little girl in it and uh, Lila Fitzgerald we found her and it was the first time that I felt really protective of her and because it was her first film and um she was so little at that time you know at eight years old and oh she's God. so good but she was I realized um as a, like all of a sudden I stopped hanging out with my crew, I was really worried about her. And it was the first time that I realized that's not different than my other actors, you know, needing to keep a safe space for them and to be there for them isn't different than me taking care of Lila. So that was, you know, I, I think that was a huge breakthrough for, for me as a, as a director. Until then I was like, oh God, you know, you guys are having an emo moment. I'm totally not into that, you know, can we, and I, again, that's a, I think I always love genre films. I love horror. That's what I, I specialize in. 
but there was a comfort in we're doing special effects we're doing like we're like we're setting up a suspense shot we're setting up these things it's not about the drama it's not the it, it's performance but it's not perfor it's heightened performance and it was the subtleties that I had a really hard time with when I first started with the with the actors that's like again there are different species until I it clicked in my head that it's like oh you know what your your you your job as a as a director is really keeping that safe space so they can you know what I mean like your other departments can take care of themselves but those actors are really relying on you to you know pick, take care of their emotional safe space that's a hard one for a lot of people. They they some do sometimes do shy away from that and get their ads to deal with all of that emotion. Oh God, yeah. But then you realize that um, you know again it, you have a whole team around you, but there's nothing like your relationship with that actor. And you're again um, doing everything. I I don't do as many documentaries as you. I do a bit of true crime, but even still, again, you know whether it's a real you know real life subject matter person or an actor, they, they, they take that same amount of care. And, the, and uh, yeah, and you realize that if you set up that safe space for them, they do better work and the whole show gets elevated as compared to, you know, here. <laughs> I just like playing with the lights, I'm over here, you know, and I, I see that with other directors as well. So we're, we're all a little bit intimidated by um, the full emotional. <laughs> How important was it for you um, when you started out um, to establish a team around you, like a core team. Like I know you have a producer that you work with all, all the time. You guys are an amazing team, but how did you find other people right from the beginning or, did, or were you sort of like out there just pulling together crew as they came along? You know, um, I've been really lucky because I was producing for so many years that there was a lot of crew that were coming over from when I was producing that I, I could already tell that we actually had a good relationship and a good shorthand. Because again, as a producer in a lot of these things, depending on who your director is, sometimes you're, um, you know, like I, I had a DP who I met on a different short film and we had a problematic director. And, you know, we, we kind of bonded over the fact that we had so many problems with that same director, so, you know, like, in, and I, I remember meeting with him afterward and he's like, let's not do that again. I was like, yeah, let's not. <laughs> so he was very, uh, very supportive throughout my, my career as well. And so, um, yeah, I, and I had the same editor for almost every long form film. Uh, Jeannie Slater has basically been my, my editor, but I met her in a documentary. And she specializes in a wildlife documentary and she had done some true crime as well. But I met her in the edit suite when I was producing something else on a different show and we just hit it off. And so we had the same sense of humor, really dark sense of humor. And I loved how she cut. And uh, it's funny because when you look at her reel, it's really nothing like what we do together. And so that, that's, that, um, it's like developing a shorthand with your team. And uh, I, I still, even as a feature director, that's why I still do short films. I love trying out new members of the team. Uh, oh, Pat, Patrick Caird, who has done, uh, he's basically scored almost every one of my films. Yeah. And we also have that same language. You know, I played music for so long and Pat and I will come up with a palette for the, for the score before we even start. Um, he gets my scripts before we even shoot. So I bring my I bring my whole post team on very, very early. So everyone's already talking about things. And Pat and I have such a good relationship too that he'll be like, oh, I, I'm picturing like we're, we'll be going through the script very early. And he'll, he'll be like, you know, I need a, a beat here. So then as a director, I'm actually already thinking that on set, we're thinking, you know what? I could give Pat a little extra room here. He wants to do something in this bit. So I will, it's, it's uh, thinking that way as compared to, you know what I mean? Like doing it after the fact and scrambling and looking for your post. So how much, uh, uh, that's very cool, by the way, that's, you're very lucky and that's just amazing. You can tell because your films are very cohesive and that you've got that team that you've worked with, but how precious are you about sharing your script before it's ready? Like, do you keep everything very, no? I, 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 I'm terrible for actually oversharing too fast and in really <laughs> early draft form where people are like, is this a script yet? And you're like, a script what and I remember sending uh the Chris of Willow song our our third feature to my producer and she like care, other Karen she's also Karen sometimes actually on set they don't know that there's another Karen and I think they thought because I would be like well pro ask producer Karen and they thought it was me only in third person I was like what kind of crazy person that talks about themselves <laughs> in third person oh, but um, 
Yeah, I remember sending her uh, the script and it was 68 pages at that point. It was just a brain fart. And she was like, is there going to be more? And I was like, do you want more? She goes, well, yeah. <laughs> 68 pages. What are you thinking? And I was like, right, right. Okay. So then um, I sent it around to all the, all my very kind um, core team. And they were all like, well, we see something here. 68 pages. Did you want something else? And so then I was like, okay, fine. Everyone has questions about this. I'll go back and rewrite. And I think we still ended up with maybe, I think I ended up at 80 pages, 79, 80 pages. It was still short, but um, it was ended up in 85 minute short uh, feature film. So um, I know I Oh, I direct long. So, <laughs> I was, you know, that there's, uh, for me, I love having all the suspense moments take time. And I try to build that into the script, but sometimes it'll just be like, and then shadows come up. And people are like, what shadows? What are you talking about? And then you have to describe what you're seeing. And, you know, I, I, yeah, I try to make things easier, but I, I have gotten a little sloppy because I, I, I realize how much we're going to actually work out when we're, when we're, you cool. know. Fortunately, you have a shorthand with people that understand that when you say that you're not crazy, that the, you really will work it out. <laughs> yeah, it's so important. I mean, I'm, I'm a little worried about the whole um, production during COVID because so much of what I do is shorthand and I don't have Botox. So my thing about being behind the monitor is literally I do this like, mm, yeah. or, oh, that's good. Yeah. And then face, if my face does this thing, they're like, we're going again. I ne I rarely have to call cut or, you know, we're going again or whatever it is. They, they look at me and they're like, yeah, okay, we're going again. Or, oh, she's good. So then it's, 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 it's nice to have. You know, or, that, that, that makes it a lot more pleasant, but it, it will be difficult actually, if you have to do everything. Remotely. You have to make really extreme gestures or <laughs> really big eyebrows. You know what I mean? Like really like, now she's really angry, so. <laughs> it's interesting now you've made, you know, features and shorts. And I mean, I love, I love both. I love, I, but I still am like a huge fan of Doll Parts. That was one of my favorite films of all times. I think a lot of people probably feel that way that love, uh, that love the genre. But just if you had to say, um, which is more enjoyable? <laughs> you know, they're all different, I think, as filmmaker you're it's like comparing poetry with a novel with a novella you know like they're all different forms of, of writing so a short makes is, is a single idea that I'm building up whereas with a feature there's so much more that you know you're again it's a world that you're creating and so with each of them they're again they're all slightly different and it's funny because when I think back to doll parts I couldn't make it again you know like I think that's what it is about all of our um, all of our projects it's a, it's a time capsule of where you are at this point in your storytelling, in your career, wherever you want to go. And especially if you don't, like for me, I hate repeating things. And so if I've done one thing, it's like, oh, I can't, I just can't be bothered to re redo that. It, you know, you, you want it to be a challenge for you, for everybody around you and, and just say like, let's, let's, let's try this instead. So. I, I know that um, you probably, I, I don't, the audience probably wants to know a little bit about this. I don't know how many of ta are tapping into your other sessions or not, but just out of curiosity for people in general that maybe are, are, are watching and want to know, um, were you, imp like many people that, that go into the, the genre film, film, genre filmmaking, are imprinted. It's this film called imprinting when you see your first film and it's almost like, some people ex describe it as almost a sexual experience. It's similar to your first coming of age. Like it's this feeling of fear that builds up and then you know, okay, I'm not gonna be murdered. I'm actually gonna, you know, get popcorn now. And can you just describe like, did you have an imprinting uh, film or was it a moment? What made you someone who, um, uh, you know, uh, probably grew up in a safe household, I'm, I'm guessing choose something so crazy as a, as a subject matter of your films. I love your themes, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, I think I've always been a genre fan. Um, I, I think it was bonding with my dad, for one thing. Um, he was a huge Charles Bronson fan okay. and he loved revenge film. The first film he took me to, I was five years old, he took me to see Jaws, right? And I, I, I asked him, like, you know, my father passed a couple of years ago, but I did ask him, like, what were you thinking? He goes, well, <laughs> liked fish right like that was his answer to it it's like fish isn't jaws dad and, and 
But um, so much of my growing up was watching these revenge films with my dad, you know, eating pepperoni sticks in our, like it, we had this, uh, the bigger screen TV was in the basement. So we would actually sit down there in this dark and sort of, and it was um, Brandon, Manitoba. So our basements literally were basements as compared to ground level. So it was quite dark in there and it felt like a bit like a theater sort of. Um, and so it felt very uh, safe in that way. And my mom was a huge um, reader. She wasn't uh, as much of a film fan, but she's the first one to give me, I remember the copy of Edgar Allan Poe's uh, Tales of Mystery and Imagination. Gothic horror was what she loved to read. And so between my parents, I think in a lot of ways, I never saw it as you're doing something really dark. They were, they, they, it was what they were fans of as well. And I remember um, when I was eight years old going to Hong Kong and my aunts were off and they were younger. Like uh, again, my dad was the oldest in the family. So I think my youngest aunts were all in their twenties when I was young and they were off to see Cannibal Holocaust. <laughs> Cannibal Holocaust, right? I was eight. My grandma was like, you are not going to see this movie. And they came back, my aunt threw up. And I was like, oh, I want to see a film that makes people throw up. You know, like that was so enticing to me. And so that I, I think that was a, always part of the family as far as like it felt forbidden. You know, whereas my, my dad never forbid me from seeing like a lot of these films. But the fact that my grandmother was like, you're not going to see Cannibal Holocaust. I yet to see Cannibal Holocaust, by the way. <laughs> it is still this pinnacle of this special film that I'll probably like part of me wants to see, like obviously wants to see it. But there's part of me that's like it'll never match what I created in my head or mm -hmm. what the best cannibal film would be. So, mm -hmm. um, When I think about um, your, your films in particular, I see, uh, and, and people have written about this, obviously, I'm no genius that figured this out, but you have an evolution of your creative and visual, visual style. And I think that for other filmmakers that are watching, that's such an interesting part of storytelling anyway. And that's what separates us all as filmmakers. Can you just talk a little bit about how you, the creative process worked for you in terms of the evolution of that style and how you work on that? Like, what do you do to, to do that? You know, I think that for a lot of filmmakers, we're told very early on that you need to have a brand, you know, and I think that that's been kind of both of our, and I know it makes it easy to sell us as far as it plays, you know, basically saying you, this is what you do. This is the type of thing you do. We need to know what, who you are based on that. And I remember after I did The Cabinet, which was the short film I did through the uh, National Screen Institute, that, you know, I got so much um, positive feedback for how it looked, how it played, et cetera, that I got really locked into it and I was terrified to go off of that. Yeah. So when I, my first feature, which was Stained, I remember like just in my head, I had this whole vocabulary of like scenes that I needed to have, shots that I needed to have, because that's what I do. And I look back at it and I like, in, you know, again, it didn't work in the same way because it was a different film. And I was, but I was so locked into that, like, don't vary off of what that brand actually is. Like, this is who you are. And at that point, what I did was I stopped reading any reviews and I stopped actually thinking about it. And um, with Doll Parts, it was basically my thinking of how do I want to reapproach this? Do I even like filmmaking? So the whole premise of me making doll parts was taking my entire director's fee off stained and, and basically making a short film and seeing to myself, do I like this? Do I like directing? Um, do I even have this? Because stained didn't do what I thought it would both critically and commercially. It was sort of like, you know, it, it just landed. And I just thought, oh no, is that, you know, did I cling too hard to it? So I was really beating myself up over over that. But I think that as it's gone on, it is that looseness. If people see like that there's an evolution to the way that it looks, the aesthetic, you know, again, um, that comes out just from you working and practicing and, and doing your craft. I think that if you put too much into it, like this is the type of style I do, this is what I do. I think that can be very, very damaging as a filmmaker because it's almost like you're locking yourself into something and you're not serving the project anymore. And it really has to be every single time you're like, what's the new palette? What am I doing this time around? How am I bringing something new to it? And if there are similarities, it's not something that you're like, I need to have my staircase scene. You know, here's the close-ups that I always do. It should, I, I, I would like to think that each time you're pushing yourself as a filmmaker. Well, when, when, uh when stories come to you, just like your creative process, um, do they come to you in, like, I know, I know you're very thematic in terms of like big issues. Your films are surrounding big issues, which many great horror films are about that. Things in society that are really pissing off the filmmaker, 
Correct. Yes. Um, but I'm just curious as to does it does a headline like some I guess it's probably sometimes it is a headline or a theme. But when it does come to you, do you work with um, visuals or do you sit down and do you write a, a couple of key lines or is it always different? Do you have like a creative process? It's always really different. And I try to basically do it almost when I have a new idea in mind, it's almost stream of conscious, like you just want to write things. But I spend a lot of time researching. So there's a lot of me, a lot of time me going down like YouTube things. And, you know, um, sometimes I, it'll be working on or researching a different project altogether. And so I never know what I'm going to be doing with the stuff that I'm like, you know, falling down rabbit's holes, holes on. I think that um, I have a short film coming up that hopefully I, I will be able to direct this year, um, 2021, I guess, God, if we ever get out of 2020. Wow. Um, I think that uh, it was ripped from the headlines. It was actually a, a case that was in Vancouver and it just with me because there were so many interesting visuals that I, I thought it was a, yeah, they, they found this, uh, this dentist in, in, he was practicing in his basement and he was like Chinese. All of his clientele were Chinese and um, he was just literally caught for do, like he had 1200 patients and he was just doing them in his basement. And I was like, that is horrifying. And by the time I think dental, like basically the college of Dent dentists, basically like dentistry caught up with him. He was on the lamb and he was like running away from us. And I, That's so funny. I so I remember talking to my mom and, and my dad when he was alive and I was saying, why, what has even happened here? And my parents said, well, you know, in rural China, like a lot of times, they, like, I was like, why would they go to this guy's basement to get their teeth done? And they were like, well, in rural China, they may not have like dental offices, which is very intimidating. It might just be at someone's place. So it didn't feel weird to them, right? Whereas for us, it'd be totally sketch to go like, I'm just going to go to someone's basement and what they're just going to do your teeth. <laughs> it's so weird. And so that always stuck with me as far as like this image of this like dentist. And I just thought, ooh, dental horror. Really dental like horror, dental oh. horror that sounds like something that would really like well, I think frighten the heck out of anyone that hates a drill. Yeah, I, I don't think any of us like dental, like at the best of times dentists are uh, amongst the poor jobs that um, I guess the most suicidal people. When I was working in law, strangely, I we actually um, defended uh, dental insurance. So there, I had a lot of dead dentists on my roster because they would commit suicide. It was a really stressful job. And I'd be dealing with their, the clients that they had where they yeah. left a needle down in their, in their nasal passage. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so I think a lot of that darkness is, again, a dark humor that came probably like from all, all careers past. And then you're, you're, you're constantly like following stories. Like I, I feel sometimes like a journalist where half of it is me actually just doing research just because I'm interested. Like what, what has even happened? That's weird and awesome. So we're, we're already starting to get um, a few questions on the sidelines here and I'm having a hard time seeing them because the font's so small. But anyway, here, let me try. Question for Karen. Are you tired, Karen? Are you tired of all the horror films that men produce where the women are always secondary characters and are always the victims. Your films are great. I love them. They're complete. They are the complexity of the characters. And then they want to know if you've seen uh, Ginger Snaps. I mean, who hasn't? If you know anything about horror films. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So I think that actually uh, a lot of us as filmmakers write and direct because we're in reaction to something. And I think that I love the Like I grew up with the genre. I love it. But there's also a lot of things that I react to as well. And so I remember even with Doll Parts, my reaction was I'd seen two films with the same title, Dead Girl. There was one, I think one was called Dead Girl and the other one is called The Dead Girl, I think. They, but one was done by a female art um, director. I think she's Australian. And it's basically different storylines, but from one dead body that they found. And it's wonderful. It was just beautifully done. The second one was a true horror film, you know, done by two dudes, I think. And it was about these two guys who find a dead body and they just keep raping her and then she comes to life and she's a zombie. So I <laughs> think to myself, but most of it was just getting to see a dead girl on a slab who was naked, you know what I mean? Who was really attractive. And so I just thought to myself, oh, screw you. So I <laughs> think a lot of it was me reacting to that idea that, you know, it was, um, and also the idea of revenge fantasies, a lot of time, 
it's almost like that rape scene is just the like it's the it's the thing that sets it up and yet it's almost titillating how long it goes on for and so again there's reactions that i have to watching these things and um you know a lot of the the, the ideas that i have when i start off start from that degree of oh screw you i'm gonna do this you know i don't i don't like that idea and it just it's like um i think it's like the hopefully like you know the grain of sand in an oyster where you start like you know building up something that's just really grating and you and you're you're like that little pebble of sand is just under your under your skin and you're trying to get rid of it and so that that happens a lot right now i mean the hardest thing is that there's so much that i'm reacting to that it's almost like i'm at a standstill because you know, there's just uh, so much has happened in our world that it feels like there's so much to react to that I'm uh, needing to, I, I think, find a, a focal point for that. Um, have you found yourself apologizing? Um, I, I know that just, I don't even make, you know, the kind of stuff that you do, which is gets out there in those giant audiences, but I love horror and I've done a lot of documentaries about it and I've done some about women in horror, but I find a lot of people when they find I do, uh, they, subcategorize it somehow like I think they're still so stuck in the time that this is um female exploitation and, and you know there has been an evolution in filmmaking in terms of the role the, you know women on screen and women behind the camera and the whole thing and does that does that come across your um email chain very often um I might be in a bubble <laughs> I, I think that I do get a lot of um you know, I, I do get some some feedback when it comes to that, but I, I would say that when you look at the very beginnings of horror, women have always been part of it. So when I think of the literature that I was inspired by, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, you know, like all of these classic, um, all of the Daphne du Maurier, Rebecca, and you know, Jamaica Inn, and, and the books that I loved, they were always written by female writers, and that horror was part of it. And so I would say that if anything, you know, the trajectory for women on screen is sort of in the same, like, you know, again, we, we started behind the camera making stories until, um, you know, again, they, they found it was quite profitable. And so then the men took over. But in the beginning, it was actresses directing each other, basically, and creating stories. And that was how the old Nickelodeons started. So I think that, um, and that idea of, of women in danger, is actually a big component of even our own storytelling. So I don't really, um, to me, it just feels like getting into the genre, I feel like if I have something to add, then that's why I'm here doing what I'm doing. Um, but, you know, as far as the the screaming woman, you know, naked and, and that sort of stuff, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of horror that from when I was growing up, especially in the eighties was yeah. fun. Slash, but again, everyone was stupid and everyone yes. was getting Oh so, <laughs> just yeah. Be, yeah. you know it was bad if you were having underage sex but yes. it was also bad shower so yes yeah and and then of course you, you when you have a film like Ev Evangeline and it's completely um you know I guess you could say many people say it's like um, subverting the whole uh, rape revenge thing and stuff so it you're you're commenting on other films that are out there and taking your personal perspective can you talk a little bit about that yeah, I, I remember one of the critiques I got after making Stained, I had a distributor tell me that, you know, clearly I had no business directing because I couldn't do sex. I couldn't do, like, I, what did he put, tell me? Um, what, you couldn't even show a single nipple? Like, I guess he was trying to get a, a titillation thing out of it. And so it was so interesting because... Um, I took that to heart in some way. Like when I was making doll parts, I was like, I'll show you, I can I can do this, you know? And it's interesting because, and yet I didn't want to do the same exploitive thing. So how do, where am I going to put the camera? To, like, it was important to me because I've, I've talked to other filmmakers that are like, I don't touch rape scenes. I don't do this sort of thing. But I thought, no, as a filmmaker, I want to be able to do it, but I want to show it in a different way, which is that rape is sexual violence. It is violence at its core. It's about power. It is not about um, a sexual titillation. So how do I make the scene as unsexy as I possibly can? So stripping that down and basically, how do I emasculate the rapist in this case? How do I, how do, what do I do as a filmmaker to change that? So dealing with those scenes in that sort of way is actually really important as a, you know, and I'm proudly a feminist filmmaker. I think that has always been it, which is how, how do I take this, you know, again, the tools that we have and how do we actually say what we want to say without saying like, I just won't touch it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't love, and again, maybe that that's why I do horror. I'm not someone who's like, well, I don't want to, that's like off limits to me. 
So are, are there no, is nothing taboo to you in terms of the subjects you'll take on? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty cool answer. I think that um, it, I have to find an avenue into it from me. Like, so it could be really taboo outside of it, but if I have a way of, te- like, again, you know, like, it has to, it has to be interesting for me. So it's not like, I'm not going to take on a taboo subject just for the sake of it, but I'm also not going to avoid it if it's something that, you know, interests me on some level. Uh, you said about this uh, pr- a producer or distributor saying about there's no nipples or what, what other kinds of like in a, in an, even though um, most of the film industry is dominated by, by, you know, male stories and, and producers that have a lot of money that are not necessarily women. Are there any other hurdles that you think you've had to overcome in getting where you are right now? I mean, I know there's a money hurdle. <laughs> getting Always money, a money hurdle. Right? You know, it's interesting because I think, uh, and I, I don't know that I've even hurdled, like left over mm-hmm. this hurdle. Mm-hmm. It's this idea that sometimes women tell stories in a different way. And so as a writer director, I'm not like, again, I, I'm happy to do each of these separately. I've written on things, I've directed separately. But if I'm making a, a film that I'm both writer and director on and you're trying to sell it to other people, mm-hmm. sometimes people will be like, oh, that that uh, main character is passive. They're not doing whatever it is. But as women, you know, sometimes you just don't have, like sometimes um, the instigating catalyst for why you're going on this adventure isn't one where you're like, I woke up this day and I feel powerful. That's not necessarily how it is sometimes like I just think to myself even in my own career I didn't wake up and say I'm going to be a filmmaker I am going to be the next Kubrick I literally was pushed into every single decision because everything imploded so that that to me is more realistic for my own journey and so it's very hard for me to come up with a character where again it's like you know they're so proactive that they totally know most of the time I'm like I'm just happy doing this thing and then oh no I guess I'm gonna have to do it, right? And so <laughs> that's, that's uh, to me, um, that's something that sometimes I get notes on, you know, where I, I think, in, especially in Canada, as filmmakers, we get so overnoted by our funding agencies, you're applying for money. And it's some PAs, like it's now sitting in a glorified exact, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to say this out loud, am I? Um, <laughs> you know, it's, someone in control of the money and they may or may not actually be a genre fan they may or may not actually watch the types of things that they do and they're asking all these questions about the film and the script where you're and as a filmmaker and as a I guess this is part of being a a woman in Chinese as well I, I want the gold star I want approval so I want to answer all these questions for them. And it sometimes just completely strips your film of anything profound or interesting because you've answered it all for them because you're helpful. <laughs> I'm so, curious to know, looking like looking, obviously you've got features, you've got shorts, you did a documentary recently, really cool one, I must say. Um, but I'm just curious about out of all of the, the long list of IMDb credits, what you're most proud of that you've done. It's always the latest thing. <laughs> I knew that was the answer. It's always the latest thing. I'm really (laughs) proud of um, the Curse of Willow song right now, just because um, it was, uh, it it was just the little film that could for me. It was, uh, it it came at such a tumultuous time. 2018 was a really rough year for me, you know, just on a, on a personal basis. And we made this film kind of like just seat of the pants. Uh, my, I, I was telling everyone I did it in 18 days and uh, my producer corrected me the other day at a Q&A. She's like, we shot it in 14. I was like, what, what was I doing? Really? So um, yeah, and, and so mm. I wrote it so fast. I directed it so fast, but then we were in post-production for the longest time. And I just thought, oh, no one's gonna see the film. You know, it's just, where is it? And then of course the pandemic hits, like just the weirdest things have happened to it. But um, it was also the scariest thing I ever did because I've never really talked about being Chinese, the cultural sort of racism that I've experienced. I never really wanted to get into that. It felt like, you know what? There's just too many intersectionalities here right now. It's like, it's enough that I'm a feminist horror filmmaker, ta-da, and Canadian. You know what I mean? Like you're already a weird enough person. It was a party of one, you know, (laughs) regularly. And so um, I really didn't want to deal with that. And did I want to inject that into my, into a horror feature, right? And so, but um, I'm really glad that I actually did it now. I don't know whether or not, like, am I allowed not to do it again? You know what I mean? (laughs) That's the, that's you have. Like now it's like, no, do I have to keep, like, is this the 
is this the hill that I have to keep? Like, you know what I mean? Like I, I've talked horror for so much of my career. I've talked feminism for so much of my career, but culture is a, that was something I felt very, that felt taboo to me, to be honest. Yeah, it's really interesting that you can talk about so many huge issues and subjects and, but the one, sometimes the ones closest to our hearts are the hardest one, are the ones that we're so personally involved in, right? It's, it's the personal part, I think, and it still stems back to my being terrified of actors, you know, like, God, personal, like we actually have to delve into that. And it was always this terror that if I, if I went out there on that level, they would know that I was Chinese. Oh no, right? Like, oh, if I say something, they'll know. Like, I don't know where I thought it in my head that it would. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they won't uh, notice? What? <laughs> there's another question here for you, Karen. Um, you seem to have a really great creative partner in Karen Wong, um, your uh, producer. And how did that partnership happen or begin? I was curious about that too. Oh, Karen, um, it's so funny because we started off both as um, financial people. So Karen's background is she was in production accounting and I was producing my first TV series for the Comedy Network as a producer. So coming out of my law career and um, I needed an accountant. And so, you know, between my legal background and her accounting background, we really got along and we're so different. She is literally... Uh, she's my Spock. I might be, I'm like, yeah, we're going to go do this thing and there'll be aliens and, you know, it'd be awesome. And she's like, should we check to see if the planet's actually contaminated? Like, is that a good idea? So um, she's, she's really good for dotting all of my, you know, I's and crossing my T's and making sure that, you know, I haven't kamikaze us out of an airplane without a parachute. So it's been, um, it's been an amazing, uh, again, for all of these productions, she was always my production accountant and yet I was treating her very much like a producer. And so when we went through the NSI, I, I, she was trying to make the leap into producing from accounting and I was like, okay, let's go do this thing. And so we've been, we've been working together for over, it's over 20 years now. I think I met her in 1999, so. Wow. Um, how important, we're coming up close, someone's going to tell me when I've gone on too long, but I, this is so much fun. I've got pages and pages of stuff I want oh, to no, talk. we haven't even gone through because I've just been like babbling. <laughs> no, it's, you, you've been doing a great job and uh, your answers are very heartfelt and that's nice. Um, I'm just curious in terms of, um, in this day and age when we're trying to really push women up so that they're in a bigger um, part of the playing game in the industry, for you, did you have a mentor and do you believe in mentorship and how does that all, how important is that in your life and your career? Oh my God, I've been mentored by so many women actually. And so, uh, you know, I've had male champions as well, but um, the mentorship that I've had, uh, Rachel Talley, one of my biggest, you know, again, she's she's been my rock for the whole thing. Um, Rachel has directed Tank Girl and she's got a new one on Netflix, but you know, obviously she produced uh, Nightmare on Elm Street and she worked as an executive for the longest time with all the John Waters films. And oh. yeah, and so she's kind of like, and she lives in Vancouver. So it's kind of like, oh my God. And so she's so down to earth as well. And in the beginning, you know, I would show her all my rough cuts and um, she would basically, every other uh, financier would be giving me the same set of notes, answer this, answer that. And her note was always make it weirder, go there, go to all those places, don't answer that question. You'll screw it up if you answer the question. And so that, um, her, that sensibility of basically pushing it, you know, like again, her John Waters sort of background, which is make it weirder, make it like, say something with it, you do not have to answer that question, is the exact polar opposite of what we normally get in funding. And that was so important. Um, I've had so many other, like I worked with Kari Skoglund through the Women in the Directors uh, Chair program. And, you know, again, so many people stepping in and saying, this is what you need to do with your career, or, oh, that's a, that's a minefield, don't even go there. And, you know, just even your other filmmaker friends that you're constantly calling, Julia Kwan, I call on a regular basis. She's my opposite. She's gone down the full cultural path. I am not that. And so we, we often call each other and do that. Hey, did you get pitched for this terrible thing? And she's like, oh, I loved it. And I was like, oh, good. You take it then. <laughs> it's like, it's, I, 
but like baking, it's got a bake off in it. And she's like, the script's great. I was like, what script did you read? You know, and so I love having those conversations where um, there's always a sounding board that I, that, that we have for each other. And again, I try to mentor as many, um, as many filmmakers and particularly young women as I can that are coming up. And, uh, you know, again, just giving back as much as I can. Um, one, I think this might be the last question. Let's see, uh, you can wrap it up. Too bad. Oh. <laughs> I was gonna say, what would, you, what would you tell your high school self, just to wrap it up? Like, oh, just, you, what would you tell you? <laughs> keep being weird. You are the weirdo that you are and don't try to be normal, right? Like I tried for, like all through my twenties and thirties, I tried to be normal and then I was like, oh, screw it, I'm not. So. <laughs> Yeah, go for it. Go for it. And actually, that's part of your voice, you know, like, um, trying to be something that you're not. And that, I think that's, you know, this, the quote you started with, which is the contradiction. I am a hardcore knitter. I love cats. I love cooking. I'm like a crafty person. I do not sleep in a coffin. That is not like, I don't live my horror life. I love my horror, but I've got other things that I kind of balance off with it. So I think that's the contradiction. And I think you, you, um, you don't have to be anyone's idea of what a, what a horror filmmaker is. I love that. Thank you so much. This has been really fun for me. I've always wanted to spend this amount of time with you. Have oh, your yeah. invited attention. I feel like the luckiest person in the world. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for um, hosting me and, and uh, having me on board. And I'm sorry I gave you all a scare. Oh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.